1989 was the year which um, marked the changes in Europe. It was a year when the Berlin Wall fell and Europe, as we know today, changed to a better place to live, I would say. It happened to be also a year of changes in my life in different way. I was 17, living in the city of Priador in Bosnia, where I was born. And um, during gymnasium, we got the, one of the books we had to read was a book of Erich Maria Remark, Spark of Life. It was a book about concentration camps, about Holocaust. I started reading and after one page I left it away and I said, I don't want to read it. Um, but being 17, trying to be smart, I read another book of Remark, All Quiet on Western Front, very known movie. And during the lesson, the professor, old lady, she asked me, did you read the book? I said, no. She said, why not? I said, I don't want to read it anymore because it's all about past, it's 50 years ago. Why should we read about camps? And she was shocked, I remember. She was astonished because she appeared to be survivor of genocide in 40s, genocide committed by Ustasha regime of Croatia and Nazi Germans. I tried to be smart, as I said, and I said, I read another book and I got even good grade for that, but she didn't really like what I said. Um, in the next 10 years, I would be in three different wars, in three different ethnic cleansings, and one of which was even genocide. As I said, born in Yugoslavia in 1972, at the time it was a country of six republics, of which Bosnia and Herzegovina. What I learned later, Bosnia was a, had a long, has a long history as a medieval kingdom, uh, having 15 kings, or, of which one queen, before even the Turkish came there. And after Second World War, it was part of Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. This is Priador, where I was born, a beautiful city with about 110,000 inhabitants in 1991, 44% Bosniaks, Bosnian Muslims, 42% Serbs, Croats, even Czechs, Slovaks, Ukrainians, Gypsy, Jews. Great place to live and also great country to live because, as I learned later, and I knew actually Bosnia was quite a tolerant nation uh, all through the ages, maybe until the 20th century. I grew up in a small town called Kozerac, 12 kilometers from Priedor. Um, mainly Bosnia community, Muslim community, but also with minorities and um, without any troubles between us or whatsoever. We lived together and we liked each other. I played basketball. I dreamed of traveling, especially to Europe, but also to other continents. This is gymnasium I mentioned. From 87 to 91, I was there meeting new people, young people from other villages, from, from the city of Priador, realizing, as I said, what Bosnia actually uh, is. The picture on the left, you can see the Catholic Church, the mosque and the Orthodox Church actually next to each other in the city of Bosanska Krupa, which is only 50 kilometers away from us. 91, I finished gymnasium more or less with a lot of trouble because I was a little bit lazy at the time and um, didn't want to go to study. Situation in Yugoslavia rapidly was changing. We got first democratic elections. Nationalist parties took power and I thought in my smart head, maybe I should go to the army. Not because I liked the war, but because I thought if there would be any war, I should finish the army before that, so I'm done with it. One of the m m biggest mistakes in my life, I would say. So in June 91, I joined the army. These pictures are from that period. Um, the five guys you see there, they're all Bosnians. Two Bosniaks, two Serbs, one Croat. At the time, and even now, we didn't care about our origin. September 91, war in Croatia already started. Tuđman, president of Croatia, and Milosevic, were fighting against each other in Croatia. And at the same time, what we didn't know is that in March 91, they made a deal to split my country, Bosnia-Herzegovina, into two. Something we realized later. 
The region where I was situated in, in front line was actually 70 kilometers from my own hometown. So being there, I realized life in my, my town is going on as it is, and I'm here fighting for what? First village we came in, I came to the, to the room, to the house, and I saw three beautiful pictures of three, three children, people left, Croats left already, and I realized this is not my war. I am aggressor here. So a month later, I succeeded to desert, to leave the army, go to Austria for asylum, go back to Bosnia, and be there during the referendum for independence on 1st of March, when majority of my people chose for independence. That's what EU and US and UN asked us to do. That's why all of them recognized Bosnia on 6th of April 1992 as an independent country. At the same time, the war started. Sarajevo, our capital, was under siege. Eastern Bosnia was completely ethnically cleansed. Cities like Visegrad, Foča, Zvornik were burning in front of our eyes, in front of our on TVs. Kozrac was surrounded by Yugoslav army and Bosnian Serbs who were armed by, uh, by, by army. And on 24th of May, they attacked. The end balance is over 1,800 people killed, many women raped, whole town was destroyed in a couple of months. The guy in the picture is one of my best friends, maybe my best friend, my neighbor, who didn't make it. We don't even know where his grave is. I mean, there is no grave. The mosques you see there from uh, Kozrats, all the mosques were destroyed. Even all the mosques in all what's called today Republic of Srpska were destroyed. Only one was there. On 30 May 92, I ended up in a place called Omarska. It's on the picture. It became a concentration camp. I was there with my father, and there were two other camps in the region, in the municipality, Ternopolje and Keraten. Ratko Mladic, general of Bosnian Serb army, and Radovan Karadzic, political leader, met together with all their leadership on 12 May 1992 in Banja Luka, in secret meeting, and Karadzic presented the plan. Six points plan, point one was physical division of ethnic groups in Bosnia. Ratko Mladic stood up, he's the officer, he learned about warfare, about genocide convention, and he said, I quote, people and nations are no keys to be moved from one pocket to the other. This, what you're calling us to do is genocide. I don't know how you're going to explain this to the world. But still, it happened. Capital of Bosnia was under siege. In 93, there was war between Croats and Bosnian army, resulting that in 93, democratic, legally chosen government of Bosnia, together with its army, had 12% of territory of the country in its hands. I was in Omarska with, with my dad and uh, two and a half, three thousand other civilians from, from Prijedor, Kozrac, other villages. I used to say this was Auschwitz of Bosnia. I don't want to compare Auschwitz with, with anything, but if you look at this regional war, some survivors of Holocaust said Omarska was echo of Auschwitz. We were sleeping on the floor. We had once a day food. We were listening to screams of people every single day. They were counting dead bodies around the White House, the place where they would put some of us to be tortured and killed. They were thinking of ways how to kill more innovative. The, the bullet was really kind of present you would get. My teacher of chemistry was killed. My teacher of physics was killed in three days. His wife was watching him dying, and she was killed afterwards too. She was one of 37 women there. All of them were raped. Five of them did not survive. Maybe some of you recall these images. This is the most known picture of the camps. This is Fikret Alic in Camp Ternopolje, behind the barbed wire. The symbol, let's say, of, of camps in Bosnia, the, the, the reason why why tribunal in The Hague was, was uh, created. Um, and funny thing is, or not even funny, it's a terrible thing is that not the governments, not the CIA, not the Americans, British, whoever, discovered the camps, but these were 
journalists who came to save our lives. One of them is Ed Vuliami on the picture above, man who, together with Penny Marshall, came to the camps, wrote about it. She um, and her television showed the pictures, and then the world woke up from watching Barcelona Olympics 92. In the middle of it's my picture from the camp. I was about 50 kilo. Just before that, I could not anymore walk or talk. And if my dad wasn't there, if my mother did not manage to send some money to us, I would not be standing here today. My grandmother, she stayed at home and we never found her. One of the thousand more missing people of about three and a half thousand killed. After the camps were discovered, we, went, we were sent to Manjača camp. This is the gate of Manjača and it says in Cyrillic, camp, entrance forbidden. In Manjača we stayed for about four months until December 92. The conditions were a little bit better, but still not really good as, as it could say. It, it was still a camp. Finally, we were sent to Croatia, to Karlovac. Uh, we were protected by UNHCR, Red Cross, and we could more or less choose where to go. In the meantime, I realized my younger brother was in the Netherlands. My parents, another brother and sister, survived, and they were in central Bosnia, and I decided to go to the Netherlands. Started to pick up my life again, um, got a job, started study law at some point, got a job at Schiphol Airport, Amsterdam, and it was still not the end of wars in the Balkans, because in 99, since I was working for the Immigration Service, and I still do, I was asked to join the team, special team, to select Kosovo refugees from Macedonia, being there as refugee during the Kosovo War in 1999, which I did. So, this was my third role in the Third War, this time saving people, more or less. I mean, they were not in, in, in life danger, but the conditions where they were living was, were not really good. And I got my chance to travel through my work. I rebuilt my life and I um, have seen a lot of countries especially in Europe, but also outside, and try to go on to make something of it. But at the same time, Bosnia and Omarska were still in me, and I did not know what, how to deal with it, what to do with it. So one of the things we, me, and many other survivors started was an initiative to build a memorial in Omarska. Some of the things are to speak about it, to visit these places. So each year we visit Omarska, in particular on 6th of, August, 6th of August each year. So I invite you and anyone who's listening to join us on 6th of August, because there, there is a reason to, to go there. Another initiative which also started recently is so-called White Armband Day. Non-Serbs from Prijedor who were not killed, who were not deported, who were not sent to the camps, because there are too many of us, there were 58% of non-Serbs in the municipality. Some of them stayed at home. They were forced by the local government and police to wear white armbands while walking on the streets. And um, two, three years ago, Emir Hodzic, here on the picture, decided to do the same because the local government now refused to give us permission to wear armbands in order to remember this day. And since there was no permission to do so for a large group, Emir did it himself. I can assure you nowadays, this day is being known in, in all the world. In Prijedor, many more and more people are walking there and showing what, uh, what happened. I spoke about initiative for Memorial. The largest steel company in the world, ArcelorMittal, bought Tomarska in 2004. It's an iron ore. Back then, I wrote letters to Mittal in London and to his CEO in Rotterdam and asked to preserve White House as memorial for us. We knew we cannot close the camp and make it like Auschwitz or Dachau, but at least let's have something. Interesting thing is that Mittal at the time agreed on this. And on 1st December 2005, Mittal announced in Banja Luka publicly to build and pay memorial for victims of Omarska. But what happened is that the local government um, 
was, was against this, this project, and Mittal decided to suspend this initiative. We were writing to them, meeting with them in Luxembourg, in London, in Bosnia. It didn't really help. We are writing the letters to them right now to continue, because since last year, by the way, the mayor of Prijedor said he will not anymore oppose Memorial in Marska. So we, there is nothing anymore to wait. We want this memorial to be there. Instead of building memorial for Marska, as he promised, Mittal built Orbit. It's this ugly thing you can see, which was built from iron from all over the world for the Olympics in London, 2012. Again, Olympics. But the fact is that Mittal built this also with iron from Marska, knowing that there could be human remains inside the camp. We still miss many of, of our friends, of our people. So this ugly thing is actually maybe even containing human remains. As I used to say, this is making bloody shadow over the city of London. 2012, we decided to make this public, so together with our friends from Belgrade, Serbia, Milica Tomic and her uh, group Four Faces of Amarska, Goldsmith University from, from uh, London, we had a press conference and we called Orbit not the monument for Olympics, but the monument for as a memorial in exile. Last year, the biggest mass grave in Europe since the World War II was discovered in Tomasica in Priedor, containing at the moment 430 bodies and probably even more. It's only 30 kilometers from the EU border with Croatia. Mr. Miron, president of tribunal, visited last year Tomasica in Omarska, and Mittal people did not even allow him to see anything else but White House. While Karadzic and Mladic today are being accused and defending themselves for genocide, as Mladic announced in 1992. As I said, every year we are in Omarska on 6th of August, and with group of which I started on Facebook, Guardians of Omarska, you can see it on the T-shirts, we are also part of this commemoration. One of the people in the pictures is the Deputy Ambassador of the United States in Sarajevo. We have more and more attention on, on, on this date, but still there is no monument. And why do we need a monument? If you look back in the past, if you look Germany, if you look Rwanda, you can see that nations who have been in this situation, on behalf of whose nations genocide or ethnic cleansing was committed, and who deal with it by recognizing what happened, that's what leads to reconciliation. That's what we need in Bosnia too. Ed Vuljami said also, recognition is a path to reconciliation. In his book, The War is Dead, Long Live the War, uh, he wrote about this a lot. It's one of the best books of Bosnia. I would uh, recommend it for, for all of you. Last thing, what I would like to say is something which even surprised me a little bit, made me proud of my people. In May this year, we had great catastrophe in Bosnia, floods. Tens of cities and, and villages were on the water. 35 people died. From Netherlands, we organized help Bosnia community together with Dutch people, all others. You can see the, our link for our site. Send goods, send money to people to, to, to save them, to, to bring food, etc. On your right, you can see the small uh, boat with people from Kozerac, my friends, who took food from Kozerac, which was not hit by floods, to Priedor. And even using the boats to go to the villages around the Priedor to save people, to give them food. And they went even to the villages where Bosnian Serbs live, their neighbors, knowing that some of them were involved in genocide 1992, in murders, maybe even the guards in the camps, the ones who destroyed Kozrads. They were strong enough to show human dignity, to show, to show heart and to go, to go there and, and to help. And that's, as I said in the beginning, that's Bosnia too. That's tolerance, that's how we are. But what we need nowadays is to deal with our past. And that's something which is still, uh, unfortunately, not happening. But I do hope that um, um, we will finally learn our lessons and start reading read books about camps, something which I didn't do in, 19, in 1989. Thank you.